preservation of and increased access to the 92nd Street Y Humanities Audio Archives is generously funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities. Thank you and good evening. It is a uh, special pleasure for me to uh, introduce uh, two old friends uh, this evening. Um, our speaker, uh, Samuel Lippmann, and our uh, moderator and uh, interrogator, uh, John Gross. Um, Samuel Lippmann, as many of you will know, brings an unusual combination of talents uh, to the discussion of criticism, the theme of this series, and of course particularly to the criticism of music. He is a pianist, an author, and music critic, the artistic director of the Waterloo Music Festival and School, the music critic for commentary, and also, of course, the a publisher of the New Criterion, in which many of his writings on music also appear, and a member of the National uh, Council on the Arts. He was educated at San Francisco State College and the University of California at Berkeley, as well as the Juilliard School of Music, the L'Ecole Monteur, and studied with, among many other distinguished musical figures, Rosina Levine and Darius Mio. Uh, he made his debut as a pianist. It uh, makes me gulp to say in San Francisco in 1943. Uh, he uh, is also uh, has served for some years as a member of the National Council on the Arts. Uh, Mr. Lippmann will speak this evening on James Huneker and America's Musical Coming of Age. Samuel Lippmann and John Gross. I want to thank you tonight <clears throat> for coming. And that is more, I think, than a formal thanks. Because the man about whom I'm going to speak tonight is by no stretch of the imagination a well-known figure. He was a well-known figure. And he was a very important figure. But time passes. And our candidates, successful candidates for importance, change. So James Huneker is now almost forgotten. And the conventional wisdom has it that one should let forgotten dogs die. I think that's a terrible idea. I have no idea what difference it makes to Huneker tonight, whether we talk about him. I do know that discussing an important historical figure enriches our own lives and the lives of those who will come after us. Imagine a small child, said by some to be musically precocious, sitting at a Steinway grand piano more than 40 years ago, vainly attempting to show interest in practicing some small pieces of Chopin. The California sun was shining outside, as it still does today in California. The day was short, and the practice hours were long. The demands of a doting mother and of a piano teacher of the old Russian school were strict even when not severe. And to the child, the prospect of a lifetime of practiced, practice just possibly someday making perfect seemed dull indeed. But wait. As the child stared sadly at the music before him, 
he found something more in the assorted yellow-bound volumes published by G. Shermer than mere notes, those uninvited causes of his labors. There were words, too, enchanting descriptions of the Polish composer's music. Indeed, the greatness and romance the child could hardly find emerging from the exertions of his own fingers. He found in the words the kind publisher had provided for his diversion. During the last half of the 19th century, the child read, two men became rulers of musical emotion, Richard Wagner and Frédéric François Chopin. The music of the pole is the most ravishing in the musical art. Wagner and Chopin, the macrocosm and the microcosm. Chopin, a young man furiously playing his soul out upon the keyboard. The soul of his nation, the soul of his time. Chopin is the most individual composer who ever set humming the looms of our dreams. Chopin is not only the poet of the pianoforte, he is the poet of music. There were exciting words, too, for the child about the individual pieces which sat so resistantly on the music desk of the piano. Descriptions of the pieces the child was attempting to play were understandably the first sought out. Here, alas, the child was disappointed, for the commentator's major efforts were devoted to those works of Chopin's beyond the child's technical command and physical grasp. But what magical comments there were for such other, indubitably more exciting compositions, compositions which, with practice, might well be performable when weak fingers were stronger and small hands were larger. Of the C-sharp minor waltz, Opus 64, number two, for example, the child read, the veiled melancholy of the first theme has seldom been excelled by the composer. It is a fascinating lyric sorrow, and the psychologic motivation of the first theme in the curving figure of the second theme does not relax the spell. A space of clearer skies, warmer, more consoling winds are in the D-flat interlude, but the spirit of unrest soon returns. The elegiac note is unmistakable in this veritable soul dance. I shall not keep you in suspense any longer. The child so eager to read that the practice hours might pass more quickly was I. More important, the writer of the delicious and educational words that caused my time to move so profitably was James Huneker, a critic not just of music, but of literature, drama, and painting, a critic whose historical position as our leading evangelist of the arts remains as firm today as it has been since his death in Brooklyn in 1921 at the age of 64. The coming of intellectual age, which Huneker's florid notes in the Shermer Chopin edition helped hasten for me, only parallels in a small way the major contribution he is credited with making toward the maturity of American cultural taste in the years before World War I. Indeed, the present received opinion of Huneker was voiced by H. L. Mencken, who liked to see himself as a prophetic figure in America's passage from provincialism to cosmopolitanism. In 1917, Mencken wrote of Huneker, if the United States is in any sort of contact today, however remotely, with what is aesthetically going on in the more civilized countries, if the Puritan tradition for all its firm entrenchment, has eager and resourceful enemies besetting it. If the pall of Harvard quasi-culture by the Oxford manor out of Calvinism has been lifted ever so little, there is surely no man who can claim a larger share of credit for preparing the way. 
Honecker's claim is a large one, one which invites consideration of its truth in its own time. It also invites consideration for its relation and for the relation of the writing upon which it is based to our putatively different musical life today. And so my task tonight will be to examine Honecker's critical career, chiefly with reference to music, but with examples from his writings about the other arts as well, to see just how far forward Honecker did indeed bring our attitudes toward high culture. I shall be concerned also to evaluate just what this artistic coming of age meant for the exact nature of American musical taste then and now. James Honecker was born in Philadelphia in 1857, the son of middle-class parents, German or Hungarian on his father's side and Irish on his mother's. Part of his inheritance was Fenian, for his maternal grandfather was a prominent Irish patriot who had emigrated from County Donegal in 1820. Part was music-loving and art-loving, for his father knew the pianist Sigismund Talberg and Louis Moreau Gottschalk, and the violinist Henri Vuitton. The senior Honecker also owned a large collection of mezzotints, line engravings, etchings, and lithographs, including work by Lucas van Leyden, Dürer, and Rembrandt. His mother, a devout Roman Catholic, had been a schoolteacher before her marriage, wrote well, and read omnivorously. Encouraged by his mother from his earliest days, he got on well with Jews, studying Hebrew toward a possible future vocation as a priest. In much later life, he responded to an Irish streetcar conductor who described the attractive and hilly neighborhood through which the vehicle was passing as Kike's Peak, with the words, God was ever good to the Irish and to his own. The young Honecker didn't have an easy time in school and made abortive attempts at becoming a railroad engineer, a lawyer, and a piano salesman. He had more success reading literature, quickly becoming acquainted with the work of Poe, Baudelaire, Gautier, and Flaubert. In the spring of 1878, Honecker visited Whitman in nearby Camden, but his father, aware of Whitman's dubious reputation, quickly put an end to the relationship. He was fascinated by the theater in lively shape in Philadelphia in those pre-film and pre-television days. But his real love was music. He took piano lessons and reveled in the locally produced chamber music evenings, played by professional musicians to an enthusiastic audience of amateurs. And while still in his teens, he started to write. His first effort, published in the evening bulletin was a report of one such concert. The 1876 Centennial Exhibition in Philadelphia whetted the young Honecker's appetite for travel and experience of the wider world. To his already remarkably cosmopolitan upbringing, he now added a year of piano studies in Paris at the end of the 1870s. Though later in life he was able to teach piano in New York, at the celebrated National Conservatory upon the recommendation of the great pianist and Chopin editor, Raphael Josephi. As a student, Honecker wasn't good enough to gain admittance to the Paris Conservatoire. Instead, he had to content himself with auditing the class of Georges Matthias, a student of Chopin himself. As it had done for so many susceptible young, young Americans in the past two centuries, Paris opened Honecker's mind even further to that taste for the new in music, literature, and the visual arts, which has seemed so vital, even when it later proved to be ephemeral. Honecker, of course, was hardly cut out by either nature or nurture to be an expatriate. But when he returned to the United States, he found Philadelphia dull, despite its many musical activities. By now a writer for Theodore Presser's Etude magazine, Honecker cast longing eyes toward New York, then is now the center of American music. Finally, in 1886, he moved to New York, 
here to embark on the career of freelance critic, which despite many jobs, was to describe his way of life and thought for the next 35 years. Here in New York, Huneker was caught up in a musical maelstrom. The new Metropolitan Opera House on Broadway and 39th Street had opened in 1883 with a performance of Gounod's Faust. By 1892, all Wagner's major works, save Parsifal, had been given there. And in the 1890s, Metropolitan casts for both German and Italian operas were to reach a level of international distinction only rarely equaled here since. In orchestra life, there were numerous and regular concerts by the New York Symphony under the leadership of the Damrosch family, and by the New York Philharmonic under Theodore Thomas in the 1880s and Anton Seidel in the 1890s. After 1887, the Boston Symphony played as many concerts annually in New York as did the Philharmonic. The opening of Carnegie Hall in 1891 was marked by a visit from Tchaikovsky, who conducted there his Marche Solennelle, the Third Orchestral Suite, and the B-flat minor piano concerto. European artists were beginning to live here as well as play on tour. The Liszt pupil and Chopin authority, Giuseppe, born in Hungary, had settled in New York after his 1879 debut under Leopold Damrosch. In the early 1890s, Lithuanian-born Leopold Godofsky established residence in New York, where he played and taught the piano at the New York College of Music. From 1892 to 1895, the Czech composer Antonin Dvorak was a director of Jeanette Thurber's National Conservatory. In the year of Hanukkah's arrival, he attended the American premiere of Wagner's Tristan und Isolde at the Metropolitan Opera House, paying for a top gallery ticket by pawning his overcoat. For all his many literary interests, music was his life. Soon after coming to New York, he told a story in the etude of a pianist on his deathbed, who, asked by a priest whether he were a Catholic or a Protestant, answered, Father, I am a pianist. In telling this story, Arnold Schwab, Hunnaker's invaluable and indefatigable biographer, remarks that Hunnaker's reply illustrates his own attitude to religion. It seems to me at least as likely that it illustrates Hunnaker's own attitude toward music. For the next decade and more, Hunnaker bathed in the heady cultural waters of a New York now beginning to combine the economic progress of a century of, econ of American independence with the contributions of the successive waves of immigrants, Irish, German, Central European, Balkan, Mediterranean, and Jewish, who were by now placing their imprints on our nation. He reveled in the life of the little family hotels, where excellent table d'hote dinners could be found in the company of artists and intellectual dreamers. Always a lover of Pilsner beer, he was a great saloon goer. And there too he sampled New York's melting pot. As Hunnaker's biographer writes, at Justice Schwab's greasy saloon near the German neighborhood of Tompkins Square, Hunnaker hobnobbed with French communards, Spanish and Italian refugees, German socialists, and Russian politicals. At this time, Hunnaker continued to write prolifically for newspapers and periodicals. By 1899, he was ready to publish Mezzotints in Modern Music, his first of some 21 books. Two of these books were collections of previously published short fiction. Three, among them a short history of the New York Philharmonic, were journalistic hack jobs. One consisted of two volumes of memoirs, and one was a remarkable novel published shortly before he died. The remainder of Honecker's books were collections of essays on European subjects, based upon, but expanded from his freelance articles, many of them on recent and romantic music, but many also on the new dramatists of the 90s, modern and classical painters, literature of both French and English, and the philosophy of Nietzsche. Echoing in its title his father's collection of black and white art, Mezzotints in Modern Music established the framework 
for a critical career of remarkable intellectual consistency. It begins with a ringing article entitled, The Music of the Future. Curiously for a hot-headed lover of the new in art, but significantly for his critical development, Hunnaker's projected future seems to belong not to Richard Wagner, but to Johannes Brahms. In praising Brahms, then perceived as Wagner's arch enemy and artistic opposite, Hunnaker puts his facility for purple prose at the service of an unswerving classic position. Brahms reminds one of those medieval architects whose life was a prayer in marble who slowly and assiduously erected cathedrals, the mighty abutments of which flanked majestically upon Mother Earth, and whose thin, high pinnacles pierced the blue, whose domes hung suspended between heaven and earth, and in whose nave an army could worship, while in the forest of arches music came and went like the voices of many waters. Elsewhere in Mezzotints in Modern Music, Hanukkah is nothing if not eclectic. He writes at length about Tchaikovsky, Richard Strauss, and Nietzsche, Chopin, Liszt, and Wagner, mixing praise and reservations. Even when Hanukkah's reservations were quite severe, the prevailing tone is one that encourages the reader to seek out the music for himself. Thus, in the case of Tchaikovsky, when Hunnaker finds himself unable to understand the second and third movements of the Pathétique Symphony, he describes the 5-4 meter of the second movement as a perverted valse, but one that could not be danced to unless you owned three legs. Even then, he still can find the movement delightfully piquant music and call the touch of oriental color in the trio very felicitous. But for the last movement, however, Hunnaker pulls out all the stops of exalted fantasiacla literary morbidity. Since the music of the march in the Eroica, since the mighty funeral march in Siegfried, there has been no such death music as this adagio lamentoso, this astounding torso, which Michelangelo would have understood and Dante wept over. It is the very apotheosis, apotheosis of mortality and its gloomy accents, poignant melody and harmonic coloring make it one of the most impressive of contributions to mortuary music. <laughs> it sings of the entombment of a nation and is incomparably noble, dignified, and unspeakably tender. It is only at the close that the rustling of the basses conveys a sinister shudder, the shudder of the dies iri when the heavens shall be a fiery scroll and the sublime trump sounds its summons to eternity. Hunnaker waxes enthusiastic about Richard Strauss's 1896 tone poem, Also Sprach Zarathustra, clearly adoring the linkage between Strauss's music and Nietzsche's iconoclastic philosophy. For Hunnaker, the composition is the gigantic torso of an artwork for the future. Euphony was hurled to the winds, the Addisonian ductility of Mozart, the Teofil Gautier coloring of Schumann, Chopin's delicate romanticism, all were scorned as not being truthful enough for the subject in hand, and the subject is not a pretty or sentimental one. Strauss, with his almost superhuman mastery of all schools, could have written with ease in the manner of any of his predecessors, but like a new Empedocles on Etna, preferred to leap into the dark, or rather into the fiery crater of truth. Overall, Hunnaker stresses Strauss's achievements in gaining control over what he calls the indefiniteness of, indefiniteness of music and in giving an emotional garb to pure abstractions. 
In the end, Honecker is under no illusion that in the union between the Superman poet and the Superman composer, there can be any winner but music. And the critic's words once again emphasize his own belief in the primacy of music. Poor, unfortunate, marvelous Nietzsche. But it is Strauss mirroring his own moods after feeding full on Nietzsche. And we must be content to swallow his title, Also Sprach Zarathustra, when in reality it is Thus Spake Richard Strauss. From Strauss, Honecker moves back to Chopin, thus embarking on a course he was to take often in his life always determined to defend Chopin against charges that he was a sentimental miniaturist. Honecker often looks for the greater Chopin, the classic master of noble forms and large emotions. This Chopin he finds in such then less played works as the F-sharp major impromptu, the three Polonaises, those in F-sharp minor, A-flat major, and the Polonaise fantasy in A-flat minor, the preludes and the scherzi. Hanukkah, quick to find the equivalences between creators in different arts, compares Chopin with Poe. For him, they both were exquisite artificers in precious cameos of a consanguinity because of their devotion to Our Ladies of Sorrow, the Mater Lacrimarum, the Mater Suspiriorum, and the Mater Tenebrarum of Thomas de Quincey. If the Mater Malorum, mother of evil, presided over their lives, they never in their art became as Baudelaire, a sinister Israfel of the sweet lute. Whatever their personal shortcomings, the disorders of their lives found no reflex beyond that of melancholy. If Honecker loves Chopin, he only likes Liszt. Somewhere he sees Liszt as a mountebank, both spiritual and musical. Even when describing the B minor sonata, the Liszt piano work he most admires, he cannot help remarking on the composer's insincerity. This insincerity is shown in the appearance of the sigh of sentiment, of passion, of abandonment, which engenders the notion that when Liszt was not kneeling before a crucifix, he was before a woman. Honecker is fascinated by Liszt's path-breaking transcendental and concert etudes, but it is significant that he ends his mezzo tense chapter on technical studies for the piano by advising pian pianists, play the Chopin etudes daily, also the preludes. For the rest, trust to God and Bach. Bach is the bread of the pianist's life. Always play him that your musical days may be long in the land. Finally, of course, there is Wagner. Honecker is at great pains to separate Wagner the composer from the importance paid to his literary utterances. Keep in your mind that Wagner the artist was a greater man than Wagner the vegetarian, the anti-vivisectionist, the revolutionist, the Jew-hater, the foe of Meyerbeer and Mendelssohn, and greater than Wagner the philosopher. Honecker finds Wagner a poet of passion, though he does not admire the composer's librettos. In a mixed tribute to Wagner, Honecker closes mezzo tints with a kind of surrender. We are the slaves of our age, and we adore Wagner because he moves us, thrills us, and thralls us. His may not be the most spiritual art but it is the most completely fascinating. Honecker's second book is entirely devoted to Chopin. Called Chopin, The Man and His Music, the book published in 1900 attempts to serve as a brief biography, a study of the composer's psychology, and a brief description of each piece in his oeuvre. What Honecker achieves in this book is not scholarship, reasoned consideration of his idol, or even a real book. In this collection of separate essays and thoughts, Honecker, as always with Chopin, is the piano aficionado, the worshiper at the sacred fount of the keyboard. For him, the etudes 
are titanic experiments. The preludes are moods in miniature. The nocturnes describe night and its melancholy mysteries. The ballades are fairy dramas. The polonaises are heroic hymns of battle. The mazurkas are dances of the soul. The scherzi are Chopin the Conqueror. The end of a book is a tribute to the immortality of art and the artist thrown into the void of the future. Chopin did not always succeed, but his victories are the precious prizes of mankind. One is loath to believe that the echo of Chopin's magic can ever fall upon unheeding ears. He may become old-fashioned, but like Mozart, he will remain eternally beautiful. Honecker's two books of short fiction, the 1902 Melomaniacs and the 1905 Visionaries, convey by their titles something of the overheated, extravagant, and bizarre atmosphere of the stories they contain. The most significant ancestor of Honecker's stories was Joris Karl Ismans, whose 1884 novel, Arabur, still seems a century later the most important example of l'esprit décadent. To the classic symbolist and later decadent brew of voluptuousness, febrile nervosity, indulgence in drugs and alcohol, obsessive seeking after sensation, and Satanism, Honecker adds the triumph of music as queen of the arts by putting in melomania, a crazed involvement in music whereby the art of tone becomes an all-consuming, destructive passion. In these 44 stories, Honecker presents an asylum gallery of artists along with the trapped members of their families. The protagonists of his stories are varied, though curiously repetitious. A composer creates music so emotionally powerful that on its performance in Paris, it causes a conflagration that destroys the city. <laughs> a pianist now surviving by playing in a cheap restaurant tells of his drunken and botched debut caused by his awareness the evening before that a failure would kill his parents. A soothsayer creates a new art the eighth deadly sin out of perfumes. A mad Russian scientist uses fireworks to create a world conquering art, but the fireworks get out of control and kill the watching thousands. An Irish priest is taken to a Greek Orthodox baby who turns out to be the Antichrist, and by baptizing the child, the priest destroys the creature's spell. Uneasily perched between the mock serious and the dead serious, these stories now seem too artificial to compel attention. But in their day, they must have caused many a maiden, and bachelor too for that matter, to shiver. Once again, they testify to the gathering strength of art, and especially music, as a religious mania. Despite their slight value as literature, Honecker's stories do make clear a significant change in turn-of-the-century opinion about, this, about the importance of music and art. From music and the other arts expressing tragedy, they now had progressed in the popular mind to causing it. Increasingly, the word anarch becomes of central importance for Honecker who lays stress upon the idea of the great artistic creator as totally self-governing. Thus, Overtones, his 1904 collection of essays, is dedicated to Strauss, whom Honecker calls in the dedication an anarch of art. Strauss's overlordship is shown in his cold, stringent voluptuousness. And Honecker goes on to write, he himself may be a Merlin, all great composers are ogres in their insatiable love of power. But he has rescued us from the romantic theatric blight, and a change of dynasty is always welcome 
to slaves of the musical habit. Once again, it is curious that in the foregoing qu quotation, Hanukkah rejects Wagner's unification of the arts in favor of that expression in music alone for which he admired Brahms and for which he now credits Strauss. This quotation is of interest, too, for its comfortable Nietzschean division of the world into masters and slaves, in this case, the master who composes and the slaves who have the musical habit. It is no surprise when, in overtones, Hanukkah goes on to reject Wagner's Parsifal as absolute music and to find in the opera a lack of absolute sincerity the work of a man who had outlived his genius. In this judgment of Parsifal, Hanukkah is only walking in the footsteps of Nietzsche, who followed a period of Wagnerolatry with the most vitriolic rejection of Der Meister on record. In Nietzsche's condemnation of Wagner's causing music to be taken over by the drama, Hanukkah finds corroboration for his own conviction. Music, pure and simple, for itself, undefiled by costumes, scenery, limelights, and vocal virtuosi, is the noblest music of all. Elsewhere in overtones, Hunnaker scorns Mendelssohn as a writer of Bach watered for general consumption. Continuing the fight of the 90s over Max Nordau's best-selling book, Degeneration, a rejection of modern art and artists as depraved, he asserts that there are no sane men of genius. He rejects Verdi's operas written before 1880 as brainless, though promising and potent, but he praises Falstaff to the skies. He admires Debussy's new Pelias et Melisande, though without finding it successful as absolute music. He ends with a plea for intellectual music without metaphysical meanings, and his proffered model is Mozart's G minor symphony in its sunny measures is sanity. Neither the 1905 iconoclasts or the 1909 egoists deal with music at all. Iconoclasts is concerned with contemporary European dramatists, first among them Ibsen, and in particular with plays containing a social message. Because my main concern here is with Hunnaker as a music critic, it is perhaps only necessary to remark that in his fulsome praise for Ibsen, he seems to have one standard, that of realism for drama, and another, that of beauty for music. Love me, love my truth, the playwright says in effect, and we are forced to make a wry face as we swallow the nauseous and unsugared pill he forces down our sentimental gullets. Egoists carries the title A Book of Supermen and is chiefly interesting for its articles on 19th century French writers, including Stendhal, Baudelaire, Flaubert, Anatole France, Ismans, and Maurice Barres, in addition to Nietzsche and Stirner. The book treats all these disparate creatures as supreme individualists, and though it gives them high praise for their ability to follow their own way, the effect Hanukkah now conveys is that of making an attempt to gain rational control of an artistic movement all too easily allowed to luxuriate, as it had in his own short fiction, in its own willfulness. Thus, in the essay on Baudelaire, he attacks the idea that artists are dissipated creatures. What the majority of mankind does not know concerning the habits of literary workers is this prime fact. Men who work hard writing verse, and there is no mental toil comparable to it, cannot drink or indulge in opium without the inevitable collapse. The old-fashioned ideas of inspiration, spontaneity, easy improvisation, the sudden bolt from heaven, are delusions still hugged by the world. To be told that Chopin filed at his music for years, that Beethoven in his smithy forged his thunderbolts, that Manet toiled like a laborer on the, on the dock, is a disillusion for the sentimental. And with Nietzsche, too, 
Hanukkah, if not actually changing his opinion on the philosopher's stature as a superman and an anarch, seems to qualify his position. No longer is he a bogeyman, not a creature of blood and iron, not a constructive or an academic philosopher, but simply a brilliant and suggestive thinker who, because of the nature of his genius, could never have erected an elaborate philosophic system and a writer not quite as dangerous to established religion and morals as some critics would have us believe. The 1910 Promenades of an Impressionist is concerned with painting. The use of Impressionist in the title does not re refer to the painters of that school, but to Hunnaker's characteristic device of critical Impressionism, the recording of his reactions and feelings as aroused by the art he was considering. The book opens with a discussion of the post-impressionist Cezanne, whom Hanukkah respects but cannot warm up to, as would happen when he would be faced with the new music of Arnold Schoenberg. Hanukkah is careful to make the distinction between truth and beauty. Stubborn with an instinctive hatred of academic poses, of the atmosphere of the studio, of the hired model, of literary or mere digital cleverness, Cezanne has dropped out of his scheme harmony, melody, beauty, classic, romantic, symbolic, what you will, and doggedly represented the ugliness of things. But there is a brutal strength, the tang of the soil that is bitter and also strangely invigorating after the false perfume, perfumed boudoir art of so many of his contemporaries. In a revealing sign that as the appreciator of the new, Hanukkah is becoming increasingly conscious that a critic can in his life represent only one moment of artistic revolution and that his own role too will be superseded. He compares Cezanne's still lifes to those of the 18th century painter Chardin. Chardin interprets still life with realistic beauty if he had ever painted an onion, it would have revealed a certain grace. When Paul Cezanne paints an onion, you smell it. Nevertheless, he has captured the affections of the rebels and is their god. Next season, it may be someone else. And Hanukkah's lurking rejection of the new in art becomes clear when he writes of Franz Hals, how thin, and insubstantial modern painting is, if compared to this magician. From this point on, it is difficult not to feel that with one glorious exception at the very end of his life, Hunnaker's remaining books mark a downward curve. The 1911 Franz Liszt is a conjuries of quotations from contemporaries of the composer and lists of his pupils and descriptions of their playing. Despite praise for Liszt's emancipation of instrumental music through his contributions to the symphonic poem, much of the book is merely a hymn to the piano, Liszt's graceful contribution to which Hanukkah realizes will die hard, yet die at will. Of Liszt's arrangement and paraphrases, Hanukkah writes, one may show off with them make much noise and a reputation for virtuosity that would be quickly shattered if a Bach fugue were selected as a text. The very title of the 1913 Pathos of Distance, taken from Nietzsche, admirably conveys the tone of retrospection which will now increasingly characterize Hanukkah's writing and Marx, along with the consideration of Schoenberg two years later in Ivory Apes and Peacocks, the limits of Hanukkah's wholehearted acceptance of the new. In the paces of distance, Hanukkah admires post-impressionism, but without paying it the ultimate honor. Rhythmic intensity is the key to the new line. Line, not color, is king. Not beauty, but as Rodin said, character. Character is the aim of the new art. While Hanukkah could find room in his pantheon for Cezanne, Gauguin, Van Gogh, and Matisse, he could find no such place for the Cubists. The catalog of the 10th Autumn Salon, Paris, 1912, 
shows few masterpieces, much sterile posing in paint, any quantity of mediocre talent, and in several holes devoted to the cubists and others of the ilk, any amount of mystification, charlatanry, and an occasional glimpse of individuality. I am in sympathy with revolutionary movements in art, but now I know that my sympathies have reached their outermost verge. In the 1915 Ivory Apes and Peacocks, Hanukkah seems willing to accept the music of Schoenberg's Piero Lunaire as something the future may embrace, though it is plain that his tolerance of it owes entirely to the demands of reason and not to those of love. I fear and dislike the music of Arnold Schoenberg. The aura of Arnold Schoenberg is for me the aura of subtle ugliness, of hatred and contempt, of cruelty, and of the mystic grandiose. He is never petty. He sins in the grand manner of Nietzsche's Superman, and he has the courage of his chromatics. <laughs> if such music making is ever to become accepted, then I long for death the releaser. More shocking still would be the suspicion that in time I might be persuaded to like this music, to embrace after abhorring it. I have been informed that the ear should play a secondary role in this new music. No longer through the porches of the ear must filter plangent tones, wooing the tympanum with ravishing accord. It is now the inner ear which is symbolic of a higher type of musical art. A complete dissociation of ideas, harmonies, rhythmic life, architectonic is demanded. To quote an admirer of the Vienna revolutionist, the entire man in you must be made over before you can divine Schoenberg's art. Cheer up, brethren. Preserve an open mind. It is too soon to beat reactionary bosoms crying aloud, nunc dimittis. Remember the monstrous fuss made over the methods of Richard Strauss and Claude Debussy. I shouldn't be surprised if 10 years hence Arnold Schoenberg proves quite as conventional a member of musical society as those two other, quote, anarchs of art, unquote. Unfortunately, this laudable optimism that a new generation will make up its mind favorably about presently problematic art rings false in the light of Hanukkah's own unwillingness to praise any new music as he had praised the new music of his youth. The new was not what he loved. He did not love Stravinsky, Kodai, and Bartok, of whom Hanukkah can say no more than that they were not to be slighted. He did not even love Puccini, whom he found a pale echo of Mascagni. Even more clearly, his beloved music was not that of Prokofiev. Hanukkah, though he later was to find some of the composer's miniature piano pieces piquant, in a 1918 review thought his music volitional and essentially cold marked by intrinsic poverty of ideas and written by a psychologist of the uglier emotions, hate, contempt, rage, above all rage, disgust, despair, mockery, and defiance. Even in the case of his once adored Richard Strauss, Hanukkah is unable to go beyond Salome, Electra, and der Rosenkavalier. Ariadne auf Naxos, the premiere of which in the original Max Reinhardt version he attended in Stuttgart in 1912, and by the way, a premiere which uh, many of us here would have given eye teeth to have attended. <laughs> he found the premiere of Ariadne a misfire, and for the probable success of Strauss in the future, he is forced to fall back upon the composer's undoubted track record in the past. Though in Ivory Apes and Peacocks and the subsequent 1917 Unicorns, Hanukkah is still capable of praise for literature. He admires Conrad Vedekind, the now forgotten Russian novelist Mikhail Artsibashev, and Joyce. His musical world seems to have closed in. Though he writes at length about American painters, he has nothing to say in his books about any American composer, save Edward McDowell. 
only in the case of a few performers, the pianist Skodowski and the ineffable Vladimir de Pachmann, and a veritable paean of praise to the singer Mary Garden, can he manage something like the old enthusiasms. Indeed, what I have earlier called Hunnaker's increasing mood of retrospection comes to a climax in his last book, the posthumously printed 1922 Variations. In a chapter entitled, A Mood Reactionary, presciently anticipating today's sophisticated musical opinion, Hunnaker writes in his own name what he had only written before as a spoof under the pseudonym of Old Fogey. Berlioz, Tchaikovsky, and R. Strauss are not for all time. The truth is that musical art has gone far afield from the main traveled road, has been led into blind alleys and dark forests. Who has improved on Bach, Handel, Haydn, Mozart, Gluck, Beethoven, Schubert, Schumann, Chopin? Name, name, I ask. What's the use of talking about the higher average of today? How much higher? You mean that more people go to concerts, more people enjoy music than 50 years or 100 years ago? Do they? I doubt it. Of what use all our huge temples of worship if the true gods of art no longer be worshiped therein? Numbers prove nothing. The multiplication of orchestras, opera houses, singing societies, and concerts are not indicative that general culture is achieved. Quality, not quantity, should be the shibboleth. The tradition of the classics is fading. Soon it shall vanish. We care little for the masters. Modern music worship is a fashionable fad. Alack and alas, that is not the true spirit in which to approach the holy of holies, Bach, Handel, Mozart, and Beethoven. Let us pray. Unless the words I have just read be taken as no more than the passing mood of a, pro of a prolific writer, the final words of variations in all their simplicity convey all too well the mood of Hunnaker's musical last will and testament. A good comrade, a loving husband and father, the giant tenor of his generation, Enrico Caruso, is dead. But to his admirers, he remains the dearest memory in this drab, prosaic age. Two books more of James Hunnaker remain to be considered. Steeplejack, the memoirs which appeared in book form in 1920 after their newspaper publication two years earlier, and Painted Veils, his remarkable 1920 novel. Steeplejack is a charming book full of reminiscences and amplified gleanings from previously published material. The anecdotes it contains are wonderful, and one of them at least deserves immortality. I made the Monsignor laugh on a visit to the Vatican in 1905 when I retailed that venerable tale about Liszt's repentance and withdrawal from the world to the oratory of the Madonna del Rosario on Monte Mario, an hour from Rome. Pope Pio Nono conferred upon the Magyar pianist the singular honor of personally hearing his confession and receiving the celebrated sinner into the arms of Mother Church. Perhaps the delightful old Pope was curious. After the first day and night, List was still on his knees, <laughs> muttering into the exhausted ears of the unhappy pontiff the awful history of his life and loves. Then, extenuated, Pio Nono begged his penitent, Basta, caro List, your memory is marvelous. Now go to the piano and play there the remainder of your sins. But even more important than Steeplejack's anecdotes are the revelations it contains about his own approach to the profession of criticism. 
in an attack upon Swinburne's statement that the chief attraction of the profession of criticism should be the possibility of giving noble praise, Honecker points out that the poet had the most vitriolic pen in England, and then goes on to remark, neither praise nor blame should be the goal of the critic. To spill his own soul, that should be his aim. Notwithstanding the talk about objective criticism, no such abstraction is thinkable. A critic relates his prejudices, nothing more. It is well to possess prejudices. They lend to life a meaning. But Honecker's mature thoughts on criticism are concerned with more than his own individual impressionist style. He knows, too, and marvelously expresses the universal truth that a critic is at the mercy of the artistic quality of that about which he writes. I was slowly discovering that to become successful, a critic can't wait for masterpieces, but must coddle mediocrity, otherwise an idle pen. Big talents are rare, so you must, to hold your job, praise conventional patterns, and that way leads to the stifling of critical values. Honecker's novel, Painted Veils, begins with a fin de siècle epigraph, redolent of the diabolism with which Honecker had played for so many years. Now the seven deadly virtues are humility, charity, meekness, temperance, brotherly love, diligence, chastity. And the seven deadly arts are poetry, music, architecture, painting, sculpture, drama, and dancing. The novel tells the story of an American opera singer, greatly gifted in voice and ambition, and a rich American expatriate. The opera singer, meant to suggest Istar, the Assyrian goddess of love, knowing naught of virtue, chooses the deadly art of music, and lets nothing human or divine stand in the way of her career. The American expatriate, her lover, and a sometime music critic whose life in many ways parallels Honecker's, knows the good, but allows himself to be the cause of the ruin of others. The opera singer, after a lifetime of sexual license, remains the greatest as oldest since Lily Lehman, Istar, the great singing whore of modern Babylon. Her American lover dies in Paris in the final stages of syphilis. Long after the novel's many bawdy incidents have been forgotten, the reader retains a strong and moving impression that for Honecker, as for so many Catholics on the continent, art has been the other and reverse face of God. In this, his last book published during his lifetime, Honecker returned in symbolic expression if not in actual life, to the devout Catholicism of his family. As this consideration of James Honecker comes to an end, the real nature of his contribution to the cultural taste of his America and to the taste of our America becomes clear. There can be no doubt that he was a vivid and effective messenger not just for the various arts of the 1890s, but in a wider sense for the European gospel of art and aestheticism. Whatever may have been his contribution to the advancement of American taste in literature and drama, it seems that in the visual arts, he recoiled personally from the implications of much of the new painting from post-impressionism onwards. The fact that in the service of the gospel of the new, he felt it necessary to praise that which he could not love, suggests an earlier origin in time for today's spurious doctrine of the artistic cutting edge. It also suggests the importance of Honecker's role and that of his historical reputation in fostering that spurious doctrine. In the case of music, his recoil from the avant-garde very likely returned him to a taste that went little further than Chopin. In this, he functioned not to bring American opinion over to the side of the new music of the 80s and 90s, which in any case had achieved wide popularity on its own by the coming of the 20th century, but rather to solidify 
that antecedent worship of the classic German composers in Chopin, which to this day marks the orientation of cultivated American and world music lovers. A word is in order, too, about Honecker's literary achievement. Unlike his music critic colleagues and friends, H.E. Crabiel, Richard Aldridge, and Lawrence Gilpin, excuse me, Honecker was an exciting writer. In this day of the increasing penetration of criticism, especially music criticism, by the Academy, Honecker's work strikes me as possessing and conveying the golden value of interest. In the best sense, his style was always oriented to action, leading the reader toward ever more vital thought about and experience of art. It must not be forgotten that James Honecker began his critical career as a musician and a pianist, and a mu musician and a pianist he remained to the end of his life. When Mencken's Philistine-bashing boosterism of Honecker's contribution to advanced taste in America is properly forgotten, I hope that I, at least, in tribute to my childish hours of attention to Honecker, while sitting at the piano, will remember his words from the closing paragraph of Steeplejack. I can't play cards or billiards. I can't read day and night. I take no interest in the chessboard of politics, and I am not too pious. What shall I do? Music, always music. There are certain compositions by Chopin to master which eternity itself would not be too long. I once more place the notes on the piano desk. How many years have I not played that magic music? Music, the flying vision, music that merges with the tender air, its image melts in shy, misty shadows, the cloud, the cloud, the singing, shining cloud over the skies and far away, the beckoning cloud. Thank you. That was really, as I think the reception makes clear, um, extremely interesting and um, prompts quite a few thoughts. But um, can I begin with a more or less factual question? Um, his essays, before they appeared in volume form, um, where did they appear in the press? Was he, what kind of newspapers or magazines? Um, was he widely read? I'm not quite clear how well known Many he was. Many of them appeared in the Etude, which was an extremely important music magazine in the United States, uh, starting, I would suppose, in the mid-70s of the last century. Um, a remarkable thing about the Etude, which I suppose was the uh, medium uh, which gave Honecker his important start, was that it attempted to publish not just on music. It attempted to be really a kind of compendium of all the arts, though it retained its footing in music to the extent, for instance, of always publishing piano pieces, that is actually the music of piano pieces, uh, very often new pedagogic pieces, that is, pieces that were uh, written very simply for uh, amateurs, for, 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 for beginning students. Um, after that, he was involved with uh, Vance Thompson on Memzo, New York. And then he wrote for many New York newspapers, uh, ending his career, uh, I believe, uh, writing for the New York Times, where he replaced uh, Richard Aldrich when uh, Aldrich was called to Washington to uh, work in Army intelligence during the First World War. Interestingly, um, he started to write occasional pieces as a stringer for the Times about 1912, and that marked the 
a great sea change in Honecker's writing. Uh, as he writes in Steeplejack, when I went to work for the Times, um, I found a consuming interest in travel, and so I became a travel writer. Uh, so you see, it's not so dated as all that. And was he um, regarded as a commanding figure um, as the stuff came out, or as um, a maverick? Or um, I think he was regarded as a bohemian commanding figure at a time when to be a commanding figure, to, to represent artists as he did, because he was very close to, to artists, to performers, rather closer to performers, music performers than to composers. Uh, was, in a sense, to have the, uh, 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 the hand of God upon one. Um, he has a marvelous story. I, I, I hope you don't mind another anecdote about Honecker. He uh, told the story of Pachmann, who was an absolutely crazy person, but a uh, uh, remarkable pianist in a, in a very small, miniature way told the story that um, Pachmann had a fight with his manager. And this is, by the way, the kind of thing that was printed in the Etude and then printed in Honecker's books. Uh, Pachmann had a fight with his manager, and then they made up, and they uh, exchanged the kiss of peace. And Pachmann, who was famous for his Chopin playing, as a matter of fact, uh, Honecker christened him with the name the Chopin Z, which, by the way, has stuck <laughs> to, to Pachmann. Um, and, 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 and reviled for his playing of the classics. Um, Pachmann, when he embraced his manager, instead of kissing him, he bit him on the neck. <laughs> and so severe was the damage to the manager that the manager had to wear a silk scarf for some weeks afterwards. <laughs> so when told of this, Honecker commented, and this appeared in two print, well, you, it appeared to in print, you know, I always said about Pachmann that his Bach was worse than his bite. <laughs> set up. They don't make them like that anymore, <laughs> which is a pity. <laughs> well, I feel fortified by that to go off at a tangent, not to bite you, but to go off on a tangent. Uh, born, a uh, random question, though one that interests me, born 1857, he was almost the exact contemporary of George Bernard Shaw. Would you like at the point of a gun to compare his music criticism in a sense or two with Shaw's? Well, it's interesting. Um, he had a very tangled relationship with Shaw. Um, um, Shaw patronized him in a way that I think uh, he minded very much. Uh, on his side, Honecker published uh, material from private correspondence with Shaw. Uh, I personally, myself, uh, uh, speaking uh, as an amateur lawyer, would find it, or judge, find it difficult to believe that any of Shaw's correspondence was meant privately. But in any case, that will, we have to let go. So he did fight with Shaw. Uh, well, in the first place, he had an incomparably greater technical knowledge than Shaw did. The real problem with Shaw's criticism is that, at least in my opinion, he was winging it all the time. Uh, Shaw could barely play the piano. He was entirely self-taught. And the impression one has in reading Shaw's own account, which is the only account that exists, uh, that he seems to have been a one-finger pianist. And um, Shaw, in many ways, is responsible, it seems to me, for a certain kind of music criticism that we still have today, which is that the, 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 the criticism of someone who doesn't know anything about music but knows what he likes. Shaw had these incredibly strong opinions. Um, his own, Shaw's own opinions uh, tended to be one microsecond ahead of advanced opinion. And that's not only, of course, in music that Shaw qualifies under this description. Um, Honecker was really quite different because in first place, Honecker was a music professional. He seems to have played the piano very well, uh, judging by uh, the people who heard him play. It's not his own testimony. He was able to support himself for several years as an assistant to Giuseppe at the National Conservatory, which was the most important music school in the United States prior to the founding of Juilliard about uh, 25 years after. Um, also, of course, 
Hanukkah was not really concerned with himself. Shaw was always concerned with himself in my, in my reading of everything that Shaw did. One can never forget that Shaw, Shaw's writing pleases no one more than it pleases Shaw. And Hanukkah seems to always be saying, I've heard these marvelous things. I've got to tell you about them. Now, that seems to me an enormous difference. I think that also my own impression after reading just about everything that Hanukkah wrote that's in book form, I have not, I must say, read very much of what was in the newspaper reviews because, and there must be an ocean of stuff there. I haven't read them because they're very hard to get at. Uh, in reading the published material of Hanukkah, I have very strongly the feeling that he saw himself as an ambassador of the beautiful. I don't think he saw himself as the corrector of taste, which, of course, Mencken saw himself as, and which Shaw saw, saw himself as. So Hanukkah is an entirely different phenomenon. If he didn't see himself as a corrector of taste, um, did he nonetheless m measure his appreciations against resisting something? Of older composers, the only one you mentioned um, that he uh, that seems to be firmly rejected was Mendelssohn. That's right. Um, no, as a matter of fact, one always has the feeling with Hanukkah that his affections in music are essentially the pianist's canon of masterpieces. Strauss is the one exception. But otherwise, the music that he loves and discusses tends to be piano music or, as in the case of Brahms, symphonic music written by composers who had written great piano music, which he discusses. It's very difficult, I think, for us to understand now the position of the piano at the end of the 19th century. Um, the, the, the remark of, Hanuk of, of the story of, of Hanukkah is about no father, I am a pianist, is terribly important. Um, uh, there is a story that, that, that's been told a great deal. I've, I've, I've used it several times, but it is, I think, relevant here. As Rachmaninoff, in 1943, lay dying in a Los Angeles hospital, almost his last words were upon his looking this way. He said, my poor hands. I don't think we realize the place that making music through the piano occupied for that generation. If one reads, for instance, the architect Pasternak's memoirs, the brother of Boris Pasternak. One realizes that music was the sovereign of the intellectual life, of the affective life. And that music was the life of the piano. That is, it was, what does Pastor, who does Pasternak write about? He doesn't write about the conductors of the time. He was little about Nikish. But he doesn't write about Safonov, for instance. He writes about Busoni, Joseph Hoffman, Busso uh, um, uh, Rachmaninoff, and Scriabin. But Scriabin not so much as composer as pianist. Um, well, I've got some more questions, but I think our audience ought to um, come in there. Um, well, this question is, to what extent are Hanukkah's rejections in modern music still, today, the rejections of our mainstream music critics? Andrew Porter, is that a mainstream music critic for the writer of the question? I doubt it. Um, I. I think that's a very important way to begin an answer to this question. Uh, I think that mainstream music critics today have vanishingly small influence 
on any of this. I think that it's idle to discuss the uh, preferences of uh, newspaper critics today. Um, because I sense in this question some uh, interest, perhaps, in fixing upon the music critic responsibility for what we all agree is a tragic uh, state of new music. I don't think that'll work. I do think, however, that curiously enough, Honecker's over boosting of a new which he could not love made the climate in which music is received a little more difficult. That is, I think it held out the hope of this myth of the composer as blessed martyr, the composer who failed in his own lifetime and then is appreciated later. I think that we didn't have such composers until Mahler and Schoenberg. I think that Mahler was really, in many ways, the, the, the predecessor of Schoenberg in this. And by the way, I think, as those who have read me on Mahler know, I think that very much of the intellectual musician's respect and liking of Mahler relates to this idea of Mahler as the martyr, because he was not successful as a composer in his lifetime. His music later became successful, then there's still hope. It's very difficult for me to talk about these matters because I know that it's impossible to talk about the reality of the situation without there being a tendency to identify my own preference preferences with it. I don't believe, to get back to the question, that critics are terribly important in this. I think that it would be remarkable if critics would have taken only that from Honecker and not taken the way he writes. Certainly, they don't write as well as Honecker. They don't come near. The real problem, the real quarrel, you know, of the composer today is with the audience. It's idle to say that it's with the critic. It's with the audience. Now, I am no one who feels that the audience is to be pandered to. On the other hand, there they are. I don't know. I don't know the answer to this. And I suspect that no critic knows the answer to this. The answer has to come in the working out. Um, well, one of these questions um, is, in a way, of footnote or an extension to what you've just said. It's a straight um, information please question. Uh, are there any recorded opinions or comments by Hanukkah on Mahler? Gosh, I think I may have found his name mentioned once or twice, but I think only in reviews of his performances with the Philharmonic that were collected uh, just now by Hanukkah's biographer, Arnold Schwab. I, I don't remember reading anything about Mahler as a composer. Uh, by the way, that's a peculiar problem with Hanukkah. There's nothing in his uh, writing about Ravel either. And Ravel was very important already. Um, there's almost nothing, for instance, that I've been able to find about Rachmaninoff. Um, one gets the feeling that increasingly Hanukkah was only interested for writing, not for loving, but for writing in those who had what might be called un uh, succès de scandal. That became very interesting to him. Uh, one gets the feeling, as I've tried to make clear in my uh, lecture, one gets the feeling that as the years wore on, Honecker was becoming increasingly dogged in looking for something good to say about the new. And that, by the way, makes the Mencken uh, praise sound a little hollow. And it also has a rather nasty implication, I think, for Mencken. 
because one is always left reading Mencken. It's, I'm no fan of Mencken, as you will have gathered. Uh, one is always left after reading Mencken with the idea that Mencken wasn't for real in what he was saying. That is, Mencken was always looking for targets of opportunity. And he was a bright man, and he found them all the time. But it was pretty much, you know, whether he dropped the bombs on the village, he dropped the bombs on the city, into the sea, it's okay as long as he was uh, firing. Just come back to Hanukkah for a moment. Um, first of all, Hanukkah in his later years. Um, I mean, the doggedness and so forth. But um, what was the poor fellow's alternative? Not to write about, um, not to refer to Schoenberg or um, whoever at all, or to um, perhaps give vent to um, positive exasperation, which he more or less suppressed, or, or what, could he, yeah, what should he have done? Well, certainly within the framework of the reputation which he had made, he had no choice. But uh, the problem always is, of course, had he written entirely to praise the music he loved, this problem might not have arisen. But he found a very comfortable way of combining that which he loved with his public position. When he no longer could love the new, as he appeared to do so with, with Strauss and Tchaikovsky, for instance, then he was stuck. Um, I would add, by the way, that it is the nightmare, I would say, of a critic, that one is trapped as one grows older in the framework that one has established at the beginning of one's writing. Of course one can say, I've changed my mind. Of course one can do that. But, you know, record rhetorically, it's a real downer. And it's also tough. It's tough internally. So that when one comes on the scene in a certain way, um, it's very difficult and one has to be extraordinarily fortunate. Uh, uh, one, one often finds oneself stepping on one's own toes. And I, I think that it is very difficult, as a matter of fact, I had not thought of this in particular, I'm saying just at the second. It's very difficult, I think, for a critic to end his life as brilliantly as he began it. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, but even before he ends his life, as he tilts towards the end of it, um, are these psychological, even physiological problems that um, people just don't... Um, respond in the same way, um, with the same freshness, um, with the same, um, no, I expose think, themselves to new things with the same sense no, of security? No, I think it's the not? problem, no, I think it's a problem that, uh, if I may mention a name uh, that is not hallowed in these uh, rooms, Whitaker Chambers said, uh, he who says A must say B. That's a tremendous problem for a critic. When one makes a statement, one is making that statement on the basis of a finite mental equipment. And one cannot see where that statement will take one. One cannot see what the, resident, the resonance of it is. But it takes one there, I can assure you. That is, you read something, I know you, I mean, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, you read something you've written 10 years before, and you think, gee, um, of course, what I'm really saying there is, and I wish I'd thought of that when I wrote it, because some devil is going to read it, if I'm lucky, and going to catch me on it. And that's putting it crassly, it doesn't have to be quite that crass. But one is the prisoner of what one has done. And indeed, I would say that it is the mark of a critic's distinction that he has to make relatively few adjustments because of, of the mess he's gotten himself into. It's not the same, by the way, for a composer. It's certainly not the same for a composer today. I would say that after Picasso, for instance, who felt free, Stravinsky, let me stay with music, uh, Stravinsky felt free to change, at least in its presenting face, everything by which one had previously identified his music. 
Uh, after that, for a composer, it's considered even a mark of virtue. This composer doesn't continue to write the same music. I don't know, you know, think of Brahms. Think of those early, I believe they're Opus I piano sonatas. Um, I'd really like to hear about the changes in Brahms in the broadest sense after that music. I'm still not clear, though, whether Hernicke committed himself um, by what he wrote when he was younger to um, any kind of systematic um, body of thought or set of judgment, as opposed to welcoming and acting as an ambassador for what he liked, uh, committed himself to a set, the equivalent of a, what Whitaker Chambers was talking about, a set of ideas and um, even an ideology, which he was then, um, other than a general welcoming of the new. Um, was there anything that pinned him down? or Well, it was, I suspect, his, his reception that pinned him down. Um, you see, there were there were critics in New York who amply filled uh, what one might call the, uh, the received opinion position. Uh, someone like Richard Aldrich, for instance, at the Times. Uh, that was already being done. Those people, by the way, had the better jobs and they did better financially. It's sad, really, that one unavoidably gets into looking for the warts on Hanukkah when there was so much to admire, but nonetheless, we're still talking about him. You know, it's the greatest compliment. Uh, I cannot imagine that a similar a lecture similar to mine will be given on Richard Aldridge, Cray Beale, Gilman, Fink, John Sullivan, Dwight, uh, very important critics in their day, gone, all gone. Hunnaker is not gone. Um, I don't know if that ties in with this next question from the audience, but... Um... Anyway, uh, the question is, how to distinguish between Hanukkah's espousal of his own sensation and prejudice and the self-indulgence of Tom Wolfe or Art Forum? Isn't knowledge at least necessary? Well, I think we have to separate uh, Tom Wolfe and Art Forum first. Um, Art Forum is... Uh, like it or not, and I don't like it, art form is written by people who are inside whatever it is they're writing about in some way. Uh, Tom Wolfe is in, uh, is distinctly to the south of everything he writes about. <laughs> and uh, of course, Tom Wolfe does stand as some kind of living vindication of a proposition which I disagree with, which is Mencken's calling of the South, the Sahara, of the Bozar. Uh, I think that it is necessary to remember that Hunnaker was writing from a core of his playing the piano, from a core of what, whether they are the only masterpieces of music or not, they are masterpieces of music. Hunnaker was a practitioner. His objects of praise, whether as pianists or as composers or as singers, uh, were great artists. For instance, to read Honecker on Mary Garden. Mary Garden, of course, made her great success as Melisande. And Honecker's writing about her is oddly perfectly justified by a recording, which I can recommend to all of you, of Mary Garden's singing, which is of the one I have in mind, has on it about 20 electrical 78 sides, made, oh, about 1925 or a little later. She was clearly a very great artist, so that in reading Hanukkah about Mary Garden, and she is the first half of one book, of Hanukkah's Bedouins. In reading that, one understands what he was talking about. He was talking about great artists. Um, I'm not clear, you see, with Tom Wolfe, who Tom Wolfe is for. That's never very clear with Tom Wolfe. We understand whom he savages. We understand for whom he has contempt. And indeed, he's a man who thrives on contempt. That's not the same thing you see as Hanukkah, because you will no notice that in what I read, 
there's very little contempt in Hanukkah. I must say, um, hearing the passages you read, uh, of course I agree with what you just said, and um, one warms to him for it. Um, but um, he does seem to me uh, that he would be a terribly dangerous model um, for any critic, uh, certainly any critic today, um, that he's, uh, I think what you read is wonderful stuff, but it's on the brink of being something else. Um, it's What's the something else? Well, it's fine writing, which is almost fine writing, in quotes. Uh, and I think even allowing for a different taste, a different, um, a different period, don't you think? Um, well, I suspect, uh, in the first place, if it weren't fine writing, we wouldn't be so interested in it, because it's true that we have a somewhat qualified attitude toward fine writing now. On the other hand, it lives, it seems to me, in the way that plain writing has a tendency not to unless the subject's awfully interesting. So fine writing does have its own virtue. Is he a bad model for critics? I mean, a bad literary model. I didn't Gee, mean his I could imagine, general stance. Um, I, I could imagine if a few other things were changed in the in reality, I could imagine a critic coming along and uh, having those enthusiasm and that purple, purple style of writing. I could imagine that being extremely effective. As, by the way, I think that now Tom Wolfe was mentioned, and I think in fairness it has to be said that when Tom Wolfe had a subject matter, which was on his own level, he wrote brilliantly about it, and you know, Tom Wolfe was full of fine writing. That is, it's true, it's 1960s fine writing, but it's not the recognizably fine writing. There's even a certain uh, aestheticism about it. I mean, you know how Tom Wolfe dresses, for instance. There is aestheticism there. And uh, when Tom Wolfe is writing about the proper subject, he writes brilliantly. His problem is writing about art. In the case of uh, Hunnaker, when he's writing about great art, I think he remains extremely persuasive. Uh, I think his writing about Chopin probably is the only really good writing about Chopin I've ever read, and I include Gide and Courteau in this, because uh, you have the feeling that Hunnaker is involved, as it were, soul to soul with Chopin. Now, you say, John, that it's on the edge of too fine writing. Well, I suspect that the problem there is that none of us, I include myself, is willing to accept the idea that someone can write and mean it. We are slaves to the habit. I think we have come into a time in the evolution of our attitudes toward art that the best criticism is criticism which has that kind of distance which shades into academies. Uh, I know that, and I've just written about it, about the Minotti opera Goya, that my impression is that what destroyed the opera for the reviewers was not anything in the music. What destroyed it was, well, that is, was not anything solely in the music or directly in the music. What destroyed it was that Minotti had the effrontery to end the opera, essentially end it, it ends in about 90 seconds after this, with the tenor singing, O art, O beauty, to the accompaniment of a great, lush, soaring melody. That's not allowed now. And our problem with fine writing, it seems to me, is that we don't trust the emotions which gave birth to the fine writing. And of course, we didn't trust it already from the time of Beerbohm. That is, uh, Beerbohm is, is the sower, it seems to me, of, 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 of our loss of trust. Mm, it involves something bigger than Beerbohm, I think, but don't get me wrong. I think uh, even from the fairly short passages you read, um, one can feel um, the authenticity of feeling in them. Um, one can feel the knowledge that the question was asking about that backs them. Um, 
and it's, um, it is wonderful. I wasn't being ironical. But uh, it also depends on um, literary skills and a particular combination of things, which um, I think is disastrous if, um, uh, to emulate if, if, if the skills aren't there. And even in this period, I can't speak about um, other music critics, but, um, but clearly as an analogy, I don't know if he had specific models as music critics um, or critics in general, like Gautier or whoever, but one knows, uh, certainly from literary criticism, it's very much the adventures of souls among masterpieces set of the period. But uh, one only has to get down to the minor people there. What a Walter Pater or somebody gets away with um, is kind of mm, as soon as you um, come to the epigony. Well, it's, uh, all I'm saying is he, epigonies he's a, are, are epigonies. Uh, uh, it's very difficult to, to do anything about that. I would only point out that, uh, oddly enough, when... Uh, Honecker wrote this uh, piece on perfume, which, mm -hmm. of course, which uh, owes to Baudelaire, which owes to uh, 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 Beerbohm's essay on, on cosmetics, uh, uh, owes certainly very much to um, um, a picture of Dorian Gray. Uh, the in in extraordinary thing is that now, on the Times bestseller list, just a month ago, was a novel by Patrick Suskind called Perfume. <laughs> which is not all that far away from this cult of aestheticism. And it's difficult for you to believe this, and it's difficult for me to believe this, but I had a call from a politician in Washington a couple weeks ago who said, what do you think about this book? I think this book is great. Now, I know quite what to make of this. So there is this kind of purplish writing, which, which remains. The problem is in the imitation, I think. Uh, I would think that imitating Honecker, that kind of emulation is probably a terrible idea. Uh, for instance, if a writer would imitate Addison, Addison's a good model, okay? If a writer would imitate Addison, I'm sure he would pick the worst of Addison to imitate. If a pianist imitates Horowitz, it's the worst of Horowitz. If a pianist imitates Rubinstein, what do they imitate? Rubinstein's way of standing up in forte passages. It's very difficult. Genius is genius, and talent is talent, and this stuff doesn't, doesn't imitate well. Yes, but a literary model isn't somebody you imitate in the true sense. It's, or, um, it's a, a guide, a set of ideals, a signpost. Something more subtle if it were if thing. it were merely the the ideals, then I think one could keep the fine writing in in perspective. I, I wish I had your faith that it's just signpost. I think. Um, any more questions? Well, I think that was really quite exceptionally stimulating. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for listening. For more information on the 92nd Street Y New York and all of our programs, please visit us at 92ny.org.